speaking population in the United States that would naturally go next door to Mexico, but it hasn't developed. Why? Because telephone calls are too expensive. So when you allow a monopoly like this to develop, you really inhibit economic growth. And they have also monopolies in cement. You can have monopolies in any part of the economy. The government has a catalytic role, especially important in developing countries to promote development through industrial and financial policies, through education, through uh, infrastructure. Uh, markets don't develop on their own. Uh, it often needs uh, government to help them be created. So, for instance, before the U.S. government came in, there was no mortgage market. And then we made a big mistake, I think. We privatized the mortgage market. We privatized Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And then the private banks, these private institutions, behaved very badly. At the center of the, of, of the uh, crisis was the mortgage market. But there were still some public agencies, like the New York State Public Housing Authority, that did not have these perverse incentives, weathered the storm perfectly well, had no problems. But there are a lot more catalytic roles. I saw one example as we were traveling around yesterday uh, in Bihar. Uh, we went to a little village where uh, the government had helped introduce uh, people to growing mushrooms. And as a result of that growing mushrooms, these uh, uh, the villagers' income was going up. You could feel the, both the pride and the prosperity that they had. Now, how could they have learned about that on their own? It would have been very difficult, but a government-initiated uh, initiative uh, made a very big difference. Uh, yes, there are going to be some failed initiatives, but risk-taking in the private sector and in the public sector involves uh, successes and failures. And the judgment in the end is, how do you balance out the successes and the failures. When I was in the uh, council, chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors in the United States, we did a study of the return to government investments in technology. And those returns were higher than private investments in any other area. They were enormous. And yes, we had a few failures, and people would always talk about the failures. But the question was, what about the successes that outweigh the failures? When an oil company drills, it drills a lot of holes, many of which go dry. But when it, you don't talk about the dry wells, you talk about the average return from drilling. There's going to be some successes that make you a lot of money, some others make you a little money, and then some failures. And if you have a gr good drilling policy, the average is going to be good. And the same thing about these development initiatives. Some will fail, but some will succeed enormously. And if all succeed, it means you're not undertaking enough risk. You shouldn't try to fail, I should emphasize, but, but uh, uh, there, there will be some su successes and failures. Uh, the role of government is particularly important not only in promoting development in general, but restructuring the economy. And all economies are involved in a process of continual restructuring. As technology changes, as global markets changes, change. I've written extensively about the problems facing the United States at the beginning of the 20th century when productivity in agriculture was rising, that is a result, positive effort, a result of, of government research, we had used to have 70% of the population working in the rural sector, but as productivity went up, we needed fewer and fewer farmers. By 19, 
uh, 25. The number had been cut in half. We had only about 30% of the population working in farms, but still a substantial uh, number. But as their productivity increased, their incomes fell. And one of the problems was their incomes fell so much they didn't have the ability even to move to the cities. They were stuck on the farms. And they had borrowed money and the banks were collapsing. And what we've argued is that this has a lot to do with the Great Depression. In fact, between 1929 and 1933, incomes of farmers fell in the United States fell by something between 50 and 75 percent. And of course, with that magnitude of decline, house prices were going down, they were stuck. And there was a vicious circle. The economy could not restructure itself. It had to restructure itself to move from agriculture to manufacturing. And it was not until the US government, as part of the war effort, restructured the economy. It moved people from agriculture to industry. It moved people to uh, it retrained people. We had what was called the GI Bill. So it was government that that basically enabled the U.S. to move from agriculture to manufacturing. Today for the U.S., the key issue is moving from manufacturing to a service sector economy. And we are not doing that well. And you can see that in the rising uh, numbers of people who are unemployment. I'll come back to talk about some statistics about the rising inequality in our society. So this then is a, another, a sec, a, another important role, uh, a catalytic role of promoting new sectors, a catalytic role in helping restructure the economy to respond to uh, change uh, in, the, uh, in technology and in global market forces. More generally, the government has a role of identifying areas in which markets are not fulfilling key societal functions. Sometimes there are good reasons that markets fail, and they fail even in advanced countries, and much of the research, my own research and that of others, has been trying to help us understand the circumstances in which markets do and do not work well. Sometimes government can play a role in, in jump-starting markets, as I gave the example in the U.S. mortgage market. One of the key roles that government needs to play in all of society is providing social protection and in ensuring social justice. And this brings me to the next topic. Indeed, in each of the functions that government undertakes, there needs to be a focus not just on efficiency, but on fairness and the promotion of social justice. For instance, in many circles, there's a discussion of the importance of the rule of law. And the rule of law is important, but it matters what kind of rule of law there is. In some societies, the rule of law has been used by the powerful to oppress those without power. We've seen a dramatic example of this in the United States in a way that's almost embarrassing. Um, the banks used the so-called rule of law to throw out some seven million Americans out of their homes in foreclosures. Whenever I use numbers in India, I feel a little bit, to us, 7 million seems like a large number. In India, it seems like such a small number. I mean, so I always, you know, when I say this to an American audience, they feel impressed. When I say it in India, they say, oh, well, you know, 7 million, what, what, what are you talking about? But to give you a little bit of uh, perspective, uh, that's about 15% of all homeowners were thrown out of their homes. And that's a large number, and the number is likely uh, to, to go up. But even more striking was that many people who did not owe any money were thrown out of their homes. The banks signed statements saying, we've looked at the records and these people owe us money. 
And the legal framework allowed them to take these pieces of paper saying they looked at the records and the courts would then throw them out of their house. But the banks were lying. They had not looked at the records. The reason they hadn't looked at the records is they had no records. They had generated so many bad mortgages between 2003 and 2007, they were manufacturing them at such a rapid rate that they couldn't keep records. And so when it came time to uh, uh, enforce the contract, the, enforce the, they had no record of the mortgage. And they had no tracing of what had happened. Well, the bank's response is, most of the people that they threw out of their homes were guilty. But that's like saying, most of the people that we execute are guilty. We're not supposed to, you're innocent until proven guilty, and you don't throw people out of their homes unless they owe money. Well, the interesting thing about this in the United States is that the banks are likely to pay fines of an order of magnitude of $39 billion. A lot of money. But not one banker has gone, has been called to justice. Not a surprise given the way American legal system has been constructed, which is not based on a rule of law, should, what a rule of law should be, which is to protect the people who are less powerful. We've created a rule of law to protect the bankers and the banks. So when people talk about the rule of law, I always react and say, yes, it's important to have a rule of law, but you have to ask the question, what kind of rule of law is it? It has to be a rule of law for social justice. In many societies, the legal framework has been used to increase inequities or preserve inequities and create a more divided societies. In others, at other times and in other places, it's been reduced the scope for discrimination. And actually, in the United States, we've seen both. I gave you an example of the negative, but there have also been very important examples where uh, affirmative action uh, laws, regulations, have actually been very important in reducing the scope for discriminations. There are a couple of general points I want to make about this. First, markets don't exist in a vacuum. Markets exist in general only with certain rules and regulations within a frame. And how we set that frame is critically important. It's a choice. There's not just one way, there are many ways of doing it. Let me just give you one example in a relatively ar seemingly arcane area, again for the United States, but it, uh, the principle is more general, which shows you how details matter and how you have to be sensitive to that. Uh, and that is in the area of bankruptcy law. Bankruptcy law deals with what happens when a creditor, when, when a, a, a borrower can't pay back what he owes. The question is, who gets paid back first? We say, well, that's a simple question. You just write down a set of rules. Well, uh, who gets paid back first can make a big difference. When no one was looking, America's bankers got them to change the rules. So the first person to be paid in the United States are the owners of the risky derivatives, CDSs, those risky products that remember that brought down AIG, that the US government had to have a $180 billion bailout for one company. Those were based on these derivatives that our bankruptcy law gave first priority effectively encouraging. This was a hidden industrial policy. Because the legal framework decides what things are encouraged and what things get discouraged. In that same law, there's another provision. Students, stu 
In the United States, we have uh, very high tuition, and poor students can only go to the university by borrowing. And so many students have borrowed a great deal. The average American student, when he graduates today, has a debt in over, of, of over $25,000. And student debt now is larger than credit card debt. People have learned that credit cards are dangerous, so they're pulling back. But student loans are investments, and they've been increasing. In the bankruptcy law, what they said is, Student loans are the only category of loans that cannot be discharged in bankruptcy. And when I went around talking about my new book around the country, the most poignant stories I heard over and over again were stories about from young students who couldn't get jobs, were saddled with, with huge debts, or even stories where a parent had co-signed a loan. And then the student had had an accident or an illness had died. And the parent had, could not discharge the debt, even if they went in bankruptcy, even if they had extreme circumstances. So it was, it, 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 it's actually inhumane. The principle of having a fresh start is the basic principle. If you remember reading Dickens and the debtor of prisons uh, and moving away from that to the principle of bankruptcy to give people a fresh start, in America, essentially, we've introduced uh, um, uh, a kind of bonded uh, labor because they could pay for the rest of their life up to 25% of their income to the banks.